Dawn Foundation Madurai welcomes you all for this lecture series on world heritage and culture. Today the lecture number 37 will be delivered by Professor of Art History and Culture Dr. R. Venkatraman on the topic Sacred Geography of Madurai Part 1. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening to all of you. The topic that we are going to deal with this evening is the sacred geography of Madurai. As all of you are aware, man is not only a social animal, he is an animal of course. Not only a social animal but also a cultural animal. And sacrality is a concept associated with the human culture all over the world. We hold certain things very sacred. For example, the love for our mother, the respect for the elders. In every society, in advanced civilizations, strangers, politically suspected, but culturally welcomed as guests. All these are known facts. So what is it that we are going to say about sacred geography of Madurai? The very thing, it, it speaks about the spiritual ecology of a particular space. Wherever man lives, he creates a space as a sacred around which he lives with a sense of safety and a hope that there is a power above us which will take care of us. Yes, in many of our lectures, earlier lectures, we have said about the intangible culture and all that, all from all over the world, where man subconsciously knows that he is not responsible for his existence. There are ever so many other forces around that takes care of him. For example, we are breathing inadvertently. We are not aware of it. It is happening. Nobody keeps track of our breathing or keeps a count of it. If, you, uh, if, if it is under your control, then you will not sleep. You have to be going on watching that only. Something spontaneously happens and the doctors are there to tell whether it is correctly going on or not. Whenever it is necessary, we will make that out. Similarly, the child in the womb doesn't take any care or effort to grow. It grows upon it. And therefore, there is a force. Primitive man was aware that there is a force which we today call as the cosmic intelligence or cosmic force which is keeping track of all and making us grow without a hitch and all that. And Due to our own negligence or error, there may be a certain deviation which we call disease, but otherwise, cosmos is highly ordered. The universe, when it is ordered, the orderly universe is called the cosmos, and it, there everything is perfect. Imperfection has never been a part of it. That is cosmos. Therefore, people, wherever they go and settle down in villages, they have a sacred tree and put up their tents and houses around that and they live very safely and that particular tree is one among the many but a different from others. When they near, when they near that tree, in villages even today you can see, they remove the slippers as a mark of respect to that. Some force is watching them. They don't have any anthropomorphic form to that god. They don't have eyes and all that. Okay, but the tree is a sacred tree. And in, not only in Tamil Nadu, all over Tamil, I mean India and elsewhere also, you have sacred trees. And in one of our lectures earlier, we have also seen that there, this sacrality of the tree was not identified or discovered by man. <coughs> right from the earliest days when he was the ape and gradually transformed himself into a paleolithic man. 
the hunter, the Neolithic and Megalithic age, all these ages we have seen in the, our earlier lectures. And these hunters, you know, they were guided by the instinct of birds and animals around, for which they, they owe quite a lot. Man learns okay, from other animals and birds. The migratory birds during their own uh, 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 procreation and they fly from one end of the world to the another world. Thousands of miles they travel day and night, go there, put up their nasals, bring up their children and they return back to them. So this is being controlled by what is known as the season. Whenever it is winter, from there it goes to place where it is warm. And in warm countries, they go to the, uh, the uh, uh, cool places. Thus, this action in all is being controlled by what? What is it? What is it by which they are navigating their movement? That's one of the questions. The navigation is being made by the rising point of the sun and the setting point, the east and west. What you call? The, the four directions of the cardinal directions of the compass, they are guided by them and instinctively they know this is east, this is west, they don't have names for them as we do have. We know their name but we are not aware where east and west is unless you inquire your neighbor. But they don't have words but they know wherever they go, they know the east and west during the daytime and in the night time they know the north because they navigate by looking at the north to pole, the call the polaris or the pole star. Polaris is the pole star now. And they, I know this has been recently studied by ornithologists, biologists, and how they are navigating and they have all been recorded and you might have seen them being projected in uh, uh, or national geographic uh, as well as our. Uh, uh, discovery channels and a uh, lot of and now the primitive man during the time of his uh, hunting he is guided by these animals the animals you know they have instinct and they want for example in a in a forest there are a lot of monkeys deers and predators like tigers wolves and all that the the the, the deers will be grazing there carefully, very carefully. But that is a forest which is infested with the tigers, cheetahs, jaguars, what is so many. But they have to be, all the world they cannot be very very tense. They have to be carefree. May what happen, they will be going. But if there is any predator coming, visible, immediately the monkeys from the top of the tree, they screech, hey, and and shake the branch and thereby give any precaution to all of them. And immediately they look about and it is looking at a direction from where the tiger is coming. Say so immediately they take the opposite direction and run away and they try to save themselves. This all of us know, we have seen it. Therefore, there is a perfect understanding, a cooperation which leads to sort what is known as coexistence. There is nothing mine and thine. Everything is ours. When man has this rational thinking, my land, my fatherland, motherland, your fatherland, motherland, all these divisions come from the human thought. Rationally, he wants to appropriate everything for himself, but of course, from the primitive time onwards, Man owes quite a lot to these animals. And furthermore, in the literal area, where well, on the seashore and all that, he is guided by, he need not go in search of the fish deep into the hot, uh, uh, sea and all that. He sees wherever the girls are circling, immediately identifies that there are fish for him. He goes to them and they help him because even if they are not able to catch man by his net catches a lot and shares with these girls and there, thereby cooperation is an unavoidable, a natural product of 
the nature's existence. This we have to bear in mind. Now, from the man's in, in his evolution, we all know that there are three stages. The earliest man was a hunter. The hunter was guided by these animals and birds. And the next is the pastoral. In the pastoral age, he was guided by not these wild animals, but now he has learned to domesticate the bovine, the cows, cows and bulls. They are he is taking them. Not that he is leading them. Actually, the cattle is leading him because they know instinctively where better grass is greener grass pasture for viable and where better water will be available. They will be going on. He will be going only as a rescuer of them from the wolves and the predators and so on. He will be having a, a, some uh, a, 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 a sword or a tumble, a long stick and all that too. And now he is guided by them. He is going on and using their wealth. Thus, a sort of coexistence, a sharing. And they go. I have told him one of my lectures here. And everywhere we go and see, in, in doing the course of my anthropological survey of the region, Madurai district, I visited a number of villages. And each village has a sacred tree. Even if there are 20 houses, they have one sacred tree. And the moment I went there as a student, I went as a student of architecture, religious architecture. For me, temple means must have an architecture. That is what I thought. I went there, I asked as soon as I got from the bus, a few fellows came there and I introduced myself and I want to see your temple. temple. Yes, we have a very good temple, come on. They took me. And you know, when I they were taking me to the forest like place. A lot of trees were there. Where is the temple? We are nearing that, sir. We tell it. There was no more nothing was available. Because I just put in the architecture and interested more in the structure. Then he said, sir, remove the temples. Just put it on. Why not? Only on the top, we have near the temple. Where is the temple? This is the temple he showed them. That's the first time in my life I saw a tree as a temple. For them, that is the temple. Then where is the idol? Idol? We don't have any. That is idol. Sami where or Kovil where? Now you have divided. You have a statue as a Sami or a lingam as a Sami and uh, you have structure as a temple. We are divisive. We are not denying, unifying. Understand? Nature is naturally unifying, but we are going contrary to the direction of nature, dividing, dividing. For science that is essential. But for a happy living, that's not. Okay. In philosophy, you can do it. But, but now, in religion, we have to integrate all the people. And then, I, he wanted me to leave. And I went and saw. And I asked, which is the Muji, where will you make the puja? We don't make puja. Once in a year, we will come. And he showed the eastern direction. There was a uh, what you call a platform like thing. Here we will offer a goat to the platform once a year because he is taking care of us all. So the problem is not over. Now the problem, another problem starts. A temple need not be a structure, it can be a tree. That problem is solved. But why this? And in this village, they had a particular tree as a guest general or a species. In another village, another species. There was no uniformity. And then, how I mean, in one place it is tamarind tree, Puriyamara. In another place it is Vepamara. That I can understand in many of the places we are associated with Kadi or the Mariamma. Different, different, there is no tree has been spared as sacred. Each village has one or the other. Ultimately, almost all the species of trees known in Tamil Nadu have been held as sacred. Either in one place or other. Am I making the point clear? Now my problem is, how do they find this particular tree is the sacred? The local people couldn't understand. Well, we couldn't uh, uh, reply to my question. Well, I, I didn't bother, but however it was at the corner. And two or three years afterwards, when we were going to a place in uh, Peru, Peru, Peru. Uh, and near, near Peru, we found in that village, a huge inscription containing the names of eight villages. 
It was written in an old script. And we were three, a group of three people have gone there. And two of them could read inscription, I could not read inscription. And they read it. The local people immediately gathered, what is it written? And this inscription is, you know, they began to read. And some of them were cutting jokes. They have been written by God, you can't decipher. That's the jokes where they are cutting. But suddenly, very quickly, one of our people, the professors, who is Ubrahim, started reading the name. Sir, that is my village name. Sir, that is my village name. Sir, that is my village name. Sir, Sir, that is my village name. Thereafter, they became very silent, took it very seriously. He read eight names, seven of which they were able to identify. Yes, this village is here. That village is there. The eighth village, we do not know. We have not heard that village in the vicinity. Well, now, now, again, problem. Who knows? Then they say, sir, we have an old man in our village. He knows so much. He is around 82. My age, no. <laughs> no, at that time I was only 50. Okay. He is 82 and he knows quite a lot. Probably at 82, some people know my lot of things. No. And he said, you can cancel. But the problem is, he goes to a coma-like stage for two or three days. Suddenly he will wake up, ask for a cup of coffee. And he used to give the coffee. After drinking, he is here he goes to sleep. That is the problem. If you are fortunate, okay, you wait here. Tomorrow or the day after, he may be likely to wake up and ask for coffee. You ask your question. If you are lucky, you can gather the answer. Well, fortunately, mothers, the very when we were speaking, that man woke up, asked to work out. <laughs> okay, there was, therefore there was no need for me to stay in that village for long time. And immediately these people introduced me to him and he drank the coffee. When another man has come from the village, he says, you see, that is what is known as hospitality. He gave him some spring. You are carrying on the camera. You are carrying on the camera. The man started speaking, which was a great thing for the local people. He never spoke anything except the kaapi irukka. But the first time he asked the kaapi kurti ila. I will give him the kaapi. Then I said, Tata Kurushto nanda arundadu. What did he say? What brought you here? What brought you here? Then I told, Poor 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 don't tell that word, don't tell that word. And he said, after when he restored parents, he told me, told us, no, I was born in that village. We don't need, we are, once there was, yeah, I was born, small parts like thing, and the entire village had to vacate. The God left us and from the tree has gone. The tree fell down through our three days back. It was a bad woman. Subsequently, there was a small box. We all left the village. Our God has left. Thereafter, we migrated to many other villages. Now, we don't remember even the name of it. It brings ill luck to us. Okay. Well, then uh, I wanted to turn the topic towards good luck. So, he was speaking about good luck and became very very bizarre. Then I told him, Sir, all right. In every village, you have a sacred tree. Obviously, they do identify the tree. In this place, there is a grammar tree, there is a plantain tree, in another place, it is a neem tree. We, we don't discover God. The cows discover. This is the first time he told me. He is very informative. The cows discover. We are grazing the cattle. You will be going on, going on, grazing, grazing. We will be following. We will take shelter and rest and follow. But wherever he goes and lies down under a tree in the forest, we will immediately identify that is a sacred tree, number one. Number two, there will be plenty of water and grass will be available around. Therefore, the ground water and the safety of the place is identified by the cow, one of the cows. Now all the cows, they lie down. We can't urge them or spur them to get. We don't do it. We give a cause of respect. They are our mothers. Then we stay there for two or three days. If they go nearby, again they come and lie down there for two or three days. Then we think, this is the place for us. Therefore, where have we to settle down? 
is decided by not man, but by the animal, and it knows instinctively. We dig well, we get plenty of water, and excellent water. This is this happens everywhere. That is how trees have been identified as a sacred tree. Now this geography is the sacred geography. For them, the space becomes a sacred. Geography is a subject which deals with the earth, its undulations, its tanks, water sources, hills, this are all that you know. But the sacred geography has a new dimension. The sacredity is not there in it. It is in the fulfillment of the desire of the man. He needs something which is being offered by the land to him. The land is held by man as a sacred. Like we all are familiar with the phrase that beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. Beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. That's how I was able to get married. That poor lady saw some beauty in me and accepted to marry. Thereafter, the story is different. That's our thing. <laughs> okay. So, some defect in her eye. Okay, marriage happened. So, beauty lies in similarly. Sacrality lies in the eyes of the man, the viewer. Thus we see it. This is what we are going to see today. Now, as far as Madurai is concerned, immediately, I came here in 1976 as a lecturer in the university. I met many people and inquired and taught a lot of notes. And many of the people, they said, Sir, I am from Ramana district. Sir, I am from Kanyakumari district. And the last posting was in Madurai. We wanted to have here, we got our retirement here, bought a piece of land, built a house here. What makes you here? I see, this byway is not dependable as much as in the Kaveri. Ah, don't say, don't say. This is Meenachi Patana. Our mother will take care of us when in our old age. I ridiculed at that time. Now I am I believe. <laughs> Okay, okay, three days back I come out and the Vinod is into the doctor. <laughs> Today you can see me. He is like this. No, Vinod is there, he is very much alive. <laughs> okay, this is a sacred geography of Pad, right? He speaks, speaks about that spiritual ecology. Let's go to the next one. Well, geography is a science devoted to the study of lands and its features, its inhabitants. This is called physical geography. Next one, this is called human geography. When it is studies the different aspects of the human life, this is socio political economic life. That is, I mean, we have our own, I mean, this is the area where a particular party got its maximum votes. This is the area where another party got. That geography is not human geography. <laughs> it gives pleasure to fall. A few shocks to all of you. <laughs> they are <very> shocked. <laughs> that is human geography, political, economics, and all that. Some cultural aspects also, but cultural aspect is only tertiary. Primary and secondary are socio political and economics. But the sacred geography is a part of the cultural geography which identifies the sacredity of the space. And the human, I mean, he studies it. Religious experiences and beliefs transform physical spaces into sacred space. God does not make any separate sacred space. All space are sacred. Time and space, everywhere it is sacred only. That's why it is one of the first one in Vekananda. There is nothing as, as a sacred. If that were to be so, everything is a sacred. There is nothing is a sacred. If you want to find the sacredity, everything is a sacred. Understand? That's how man has to find out that sacredity. Next one. What is sacred geography? It is a religious, in a religiously plural set, pluralistic settlement. Anything and ultimately, whatever is useful for the sustenance of the existence of the man, the happy existence of man, that decides you to settle down there. Am I not right? Our capacity to buy a piece of land and construct a house and all that, 
and how far it is useful because if it is useful we get settled down there okay that is uh, how we settle down but you know some places we consider the primitive man has considered very sacred wherever there are rivers all the rivers have been considered very sacred and the early man wanted to settle down not on the banks of the river take it from me the primitive man as a hunter wanted to settle down around what you call lakes or tanks huge tanks and lakes and now archaeologists love uh, like our uh, meda chalam uh, we go together and find out and all our uh, iron age tools the prehistoric tools are found more or outside madurai around the lakes and at the foot of hills rather than on the banks of madurai river was avoided by man they were very comfortable with the tank why because the huge lake or a tank surrounded by number of uh, trees i mean a uh, lot of uh, birds and many of the birds that are fish catching fish they identify the best of fish of there the good i mean unless the water is very potable very pure and drinkable they don't settle down there and they and unless there are unless the water is very good good species of fish cannot be found there and the presence of the good edible fish and all these things are not they are again identified by the birds and the man settles down there identifies one of the trees as his sacred tree and he is fishing and will be happy man but the running water has a some threat to him very late only man settles down and during the agricultural step pastoral man in the pastoral state they have preferred to stay around lakes and huge tanks during the agriculture the invention of agriculture he has his cattle now he wants to he has discovered that on the either side of the river there are a lot of fertile land they can easily cultivate they he settles down there so therefore the settlement of man on the banks of the river is only very late historically speaking prehistoric man preferred always again i tell you repeat repetitively of course please excuse me on the bank of that lack lakes on it well now and for them any hill is very sacred though they are infested with cobras animals this and that yet hill is always and if you turn the history pages of culture this in the world in greece olympus mount olympus is the place where all the greek gods are there with the zeus at the top why for that matter if you go beyond that and in sumeria sumeria they had a few mountains and when they built the cities they created artificial mountains like pyramid called the stepped pyramid at the top of which they had their god many of you may have heard about the uh, uh, what do you call it ziggurat it is called that ziggurat that is an artificial mountain anything very top the top of the mountain is very very sacred all over the world padani at the top of the padani no one is there for us at the top of the temple of tirupati the ganadhara is there and the ganadhara of the burkan or the names we have given very later even before that without any name sacredity is there without name that need not be named and you know <coughs> uh uh when moses god spoke to him where at the top of mount sinai he takes his son to offer or okay, abraham takes his son for offering to the top of the hill there god gives him he tells him you need not he shows him a goat you offer this this is enough therefore man thinks the interaction between man and the divine takes place at the top of the hill is the one of the features of the primitive society and whether it is moses and his ten commandments or abraham with his encounter with god or and our going to the top of the palani with kavadi and it is a living tradition and this tradition born when when was born when man appeared on the earth till date it is continuing therefore sacredity of the geography 
is as ancient as human culture. That is the earliest geography known to you. All the rest of the geography, geography for geography's sake, is a very late science. Understand? Geography for geography's sake is very late. Now, and a hill, a hill is very sacred. If there are, in a pluralistic society, different groups of people, some worshipping Shiva, some worshipping Krishna, some Muslim, Skanda, Kartikeya, Murugan, some Muslim, uh, Christian, some Muslim, but that hill becomes a sacred for every one of them. It is a sacred mountain, but from different point of view. For example, Tirupura Kundra. Tirupura Kundra is very sacred for the Jews. I mean, for the Jainas. Jainas came there and settled their day and made their finances. The, what they call the mobile birds and the moving saints, they discover the sacred places. The man, with the moment he escapes from the human society, withdraws from the society, becomes himself integrated with the wandering animals, moving from place to place. He takes a shelter at top a hill or in a cave of a hill. Therefore, caves and the tops of hills automatically become sacred all over the world. And in India, you have a plenty. I said this, and if you take this walk, you can see this uh, hill, Tirupurangamuram is a sacred for the Jainas because they have done that by penance. Afterwards, the Tamils, they have found there Tirupuruhatrupadai, Tirupuruhatrupadai and Nakhiran. For him, it becomes a personification of and we call him, he is not named after any particular god. It is called Param Putra. Param means Paramatma. The divine hill. And one more additional honorific prefix is Thiru Param Putra. Understand? Thus it is. And for the Muslims, it is a Sikhal Dharma life. It is very sacred for them. Why? If you take up that uh, recall, hill in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a sacred for for the Jews, for the Christians, for Muslims, for all of them it is a sacred, but the man is a divisive. <laughs> Again, you know, even in the sacredity, they are dividing and fighting, and one is upon the throat of the another. It is, but its sacredity cannot be rejected, it is there, for different purposes. Thus, I mean, this is what, is, what we call as a sacred geography. Now we will by by revive. Vaigai river is very sacred. In fact, in Sangam literature, during the 3rd century BC to 3rd century AD, that was a 600 years old. I mean, those, that was the golden age of the Tamil people and their culture. They have come up with a lot of things. And there is one book called Paripada. In Paripada, it speaks about one god or the other, not about any king. If at all anything other than God he has been spoken of there, it is about Vaigai river only. They didn't say Vaigai is God. But the way they are associating that river with the gods, that it is such a shows. And they are exhilarated to see the Vaigai in swell, coming with lots of flowers and all that. And not one or two, number of verses are there, one excelling the other in its poetic excellence. And that's why guy, that why guy, I, I mean, it, at that time, they did not associate, it with, associate that river with any particular god like Shiva or Vishnu. Okay, but later, when man becomes what he thought, starting questioning a doubting Thomas, every man is a doubting Thomas. You say divine, which god? We want the name of the god. Primitive man did not want the name of the god. But even it is a sacred, you say it is sacred, yes, you know. But why it is sacred? Which is God? You have to tell him. Then he will ask, is the Anana, Purna, India masculine or feminine? You have to say masculine or feminine. Does he eat? Yeah, he will eat. Then he goes on asking questions. Then he must have a bathroom, but has he anything? That question was also asked by Jesus. Not that I am asking, that was. If your God is eating, you must have a bathroom also. Then he will go to his himself. <laughs> this is a modern man. Primitive man doesn't question. For him, instinct was, or I will say, not instinct. Much more than modern man is suffering from intellect. 
and the primitive man had intellect much more than that, it is intuition. Intuitively he knew that that is sacred. Otherwise this gentleman will not say it is sacred. The moment the mother says, or ah, the servant made in my house says, son it is from sacred. You will immediately remove your chapels as a husband or a father. Don't we do it? And these are all the ways we identify, accept and then integrate ourselves. First of all, identify it. Then accepting it. Then we are integrating our life with that. Thereafter we are very happy. That's not the why guy river. Later you have to identify with one God or other. Hinduism became vertically split into two major groups. One is called the Shaivism under Kalu And the earlier sacrality was associated more with the mother goddess. That was relegated to the background. These two fellows began to dominate. <laughs> See, it is a masculine world. Patriarchal domination. The great mother goddess in her irrespective of her being very ferocious with the fangs and bucking eyes and not that gaudy. Okay. Immediately she was subdued by a masculine god. She has to be rest contented with the way papa. That's all. <laughs> Huh? And Elumicham Malaman Vepapa. Given the devil its view and the psychology, they have psychology. And now they have to identify this, associate this river with the two uh, gods, major gods of our, the, our trinity. Brahma is always relegated to the background. Right from the beginning, he didn't weep. In the basic child, the first fellow to be out was Brahma. <laughs> Okay, that for the one chair, the two fellows are still running, 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 running. Hindus have not come to any conclusion so far. Saivites are easily for Saivites and vice to it, vice versa. That's all. <laughs> Basically, chair is continuing. Well, when you, what, what happened, you know? There is a, they wrote a Purana called Vishnu Purana. One of the earliest Puranas there, I mean, it has start, been started in the 15th century AD. And it went on, went on, went on. Around the 8th century, they added, yeah, yeah, what you call a myth. Myth are the history associated with gods. It makes us believe. Either you reject or if you accept, you have a satisfaction. Ordinary history, you have to accept, but you will not have satisfaction. I'm a history teacher. I can teach you history. You can listen for some time, then you will feel like running away. The little I have told you know you want to perfect it immediately, it's of no use at all. But sacred history is not like that, which we call as myth. In the myth it goes like that. In the Vishnu Purana, for the first two time, they associated this this one of the rivers in Madurai with uh, Lord Vishnu. We all know Vishnu has taken number of avatars, personification himself, and it did a lot of uh, uh, help for the upliftment of mankind, mingled with them, as the Lord Krishna, Rama, and all this. Even the so many avatars, the ten avatars are very important. We call it the one, Delta Avatara. All of you are aware that. Now. The first avatara, even a child will say, that is fish avatar, Matsya avatara, is the first avatar. We can say, where the Krishna avatara happened, that was in Madura in North India. Where the Rama avatara, in Ayodhya. Where did this Matyavatara happen? In Madurai. <coughs> this is written in North India, but about Madurai. Many of the Madurai people do not know, since it is in Sanskrit, that has been translated into Tamil by Alivya Ramapandian, but nobody bothers about them. Now therefore, for at least a few, this will be a new information. What made Madurai as a sacred spot all over India was done by introducing Vishnu well. The story goes like that. If you are willing, I will tell the story. Are you? Yes. Let us just tell the story. Once, once, in all the Puranas, they speak very high of the Pandyas. You have three people, Chera, Chola, Pandya. They don't get that much of prominence in North Indian Sanskrit literature. In Sanskrit literature, Pandyas repeatedly appear as the personification of justice, straightforwardness and all that. Understand? And if you want a perfect ruler, he is a Pandya. And in Raghuvamsa by Kalidasa, where there is a what you call Swayamara is taking place, 
Was there Pandya? Yes, Pandya was there very much. Radhu was there. <laughs> okay, well, thus you know, Madurai was known in North India as a sacred spot, much more than we knew about it. Our knowledge about science, I mean, Madurai was confined to the Tangam literature, which is very, very, old. of course, Himalayan in itself. But the sacredity of it was projected by this Vishnu Purana, where well, today this Pandian king went for taking a part in a sacred river called Kridimal Nadi. Have you heard about Kridimal Nadi? Today, today, today we are struggling to our, to be restore that Kridimal Nadi and it has become a gutter, a sewage water. Okay, we want to restore it to a river. It was not only a river, it was a sacred river. In that river, one day on his birthday, the Pandian king wanted to take part, not in my way, but in the Nadi. Because this was more sacred then, understand? And he had a dip, he came up, and after that was over, he carried some water from that. And in that part, water part, he saw a little fish cooking for it. Something like our, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 an American fruit, right? Like, you know. Oh king, save me. The king, who is talking? He said, I am in your water pot, I am a fish. He looked at it, it's a fish. I am growing. This pot is not enough. You know, took me into a bigger pot. Then he poured into a, brought a huge pot, poured it. Then it began to grow. He was outgrowing the pot. <laughs> then he had to bring a bigger one, bigger one. Then where shall I leave you? Then you leave me, you are a lord of the sea. You are the lord of the sea. Take me to the sea. He takes it and leaves it in the sea. It jumps into the water, takes the form of you, the form of your way like thing, and looks at it. Blessed you are. You have saved me. I will save you. There is going to be a great deluge. Okay, at that time I will save you. Afterwards, there was a great deluge. There was a great deluge. The entire end, the earth was a serpent except this region and the Pandian was already warned by the God. He came with his kitten king, built a huge bit. So the Noah's story, something like that, he found here. And not only that, he takes another king from North India. His name is Manu. And he tells the fish, you know, he is dragging the ship and they are taking to the deep sea and at the turns. Oh Manu, if you want to know the science of good governance, the art of good governance, the Pandya is nearby. Ask him, he will tell you. So Manu learns it from the Pandya as to be how to be a good. So all this happens and at that time the whalers were kidnapped by the someone for the call. Asuras. And this fish chases them, kills the Asuras, restores the Vedas and hands them over to the kings there. One is Manu, another is Pandya. The story is over. Thereafter, everything became all right. So this tells in a way, registered a sort of history which took place at that time. Because there was a time when Vedas were challenged by the Buddhists and Jainas. As I have, we have been telling in our previous lectures, Vedas are the poetic vision of the world. They saw it as a poetry, like the Sangam poems. In Sangam age, there was no philosophy. If you want to see a philosophy, it is a philosophy born through the poetry, poetic philosophy. Poetry, the vision is the integral vision of the poem. Again, I will say, philosophy is divisive. Okay, and the poetry is integrated. And they, so in, the, in Vedas, they are in integral vision. And here, uh, Chinas and Buddhas, they were the greatest philosophers in India. Their contribution to ethics and logic is mighty. The Hindus did not uh, contribute to those, to those two levels. And Hindu philosophers later had to learn ethics and uh, 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 logic from them. And among them, Linnaga was a great logician in the 4th century AD, was a Buddhist. 
and the Jainas excelled at them. And we will take another lecture speaking about the origin of Indian logic, how it developed. And uh, it's a very interesting subject. So slightly brain breaking, but all of it is interesting. Now, therefore, it is said, it denotes that when Hinduism was at the stake, it is a position of danger, it was rescued by the South. Yes, it is the Bhakti movement which started from Tamil Nadu, the Saiva Nayanmar's Bhakti and the Vaishnava Bhakti of the Alvars that saved Hinduism from the Christians and Hindu by Buddhism and Jainism, otherwise it would have been lost. Vedas are not sufficient to keep them. And on the other hand, we had Upanishad. That, alone, that also was not enough to make it so popular and to make it acceptable to each and every common man. So taking a first subject and making every man accept it, you know, that is a great trade which was done by the Bhakti movement of Tamil Nadu. Immediately it was taken over by the Na and they come out with a lot of the, what you call <coughs> Puranas. So the like the sea wave, from the sea it goes to the shore, from the shore it goes back. It is the two and fro, it is a loss, vacillate, I mean oscillating, oscillating way like the, the Indian culture was a product of the interaction between the two sides, one the north and the south, and the contribution of the south, the more and more as a student of history of culture I read, the contribution of the south, yes, and Madurai was the intellectual capital of the Tamils. Kaveri and Tanjavur come in the theater. The river may be earlier, but it's a sacred and all that, you know, that comes only with the, well, from the times of the imperial Cholas. Before that, they talk, I mean, the fulcrum of, or the, what you call, the pole around which the wheel of the Tamil culture was revolving, the pole or the axis was <coughs> that Madurai and the Parthias. Now, we, and then, Ah, okay, the sacred augmented by the ah. Well, then the sacredity of the city was augmented. Now, people began to come and settle down in Madurai. The king Pandya had it, sir. Thereafter, they wanted to construct it. Now, identifying sacredity is one thing. Understand? Constructing sacredity is another thing. You can construct the sacredity out. Oh. The construction of type sacredity they found all over the world, right from the days of the what we call uh, uh, um, uh, Egyptian civilization and Sumerian civilization, 3500 BC onwards, and similarly 2500 BC, the Indus Valley civilization, both of them were at that peak, and both of them were had reached not only in the agricultural stage, with the excessive produce, they were trading with the neighboring countries and augmented their wealth and what do you call city building came into being. So agriculture was always associated with the villages, rural, and the urban development comes in from, from 3000 BC onwards all over the world including in India and today cities came into being. O, O R O is one of them and the Nippur or the Oos in Sumeria which is the modern what you call Iraq, they are that they have should have been speaking the Dravidian language. And the similarly here in the Egypt you have around the Cairo number of cities of the Paravas with the pyramids and all that. And in uh, in in, in the Spanish civilization, Mohanjadaro, Arapa, so many fifty two and odd cities have been discovered by the archaeologists acts and in all of them they see a pattern. They see a pattern. They have been oriented towards east, exact east to west. Not only that, east to west orientation and the north is pure, it is fixed. How do they do? How they find it? And that is another thing we will speak about in another lecture. How the east and west is being, it is called Dikparishe Chana and uh, that is a part of our Indian culture also. And everywhere, this orientation towards the east and west 
of the and on the side of the river, river by the river, and creating a temple as the center of the city. This is how they started creating a city that is the fourth stage of next one. Yeah, the sacred geography enables us to see the landscape through the eyes of our ancestors and helps us reconnect with the natural and the spiritual world once more. Today we see it a tree, a tree. A hill as a hill, a river as a river. But our ancestors, for them, they were all divinely charged. Divinely loved. That divine charge is something that we have to restore. It has been in some corner of our mind, but we feel ashamed, shy to tell about it. Lest we will be taken as a word Obscurantism, Obscurantism, they think. It is not obscurantism at all. Next one. Well, today, not only this, wherever you see a huge uh, 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 board balancing somewhere atop a hill, that place is where considered as a sacred during the medieval period. We had been to uh, the, 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 the player. We had been to Aritapati. The moment I went to Aritapati, there was a hill. At all the hill, there is a stone like this. There, in the 7th to 9th century, Jainas have established their sacred center and the uh, Saivites have their sacred center. Well, we must all see that place. Once we will all go there. And the, one of the earliest Shiva temple in South India was built there. And it's a history you must know. I mean, that, uh, that is included as a part of Madurai. Now when I am saying sacredity of Madurai, one thing I fail to define, what is the area of Madurai? <coughs> what is the border of Madurai? I say, you have a lot of power, uh, uh, the education district, uh, but uh, of so many districts. Revenue district, police district, district law. For the sacred Madurai, in Tirulayada Quran 49, it has been said that uh, there was a deluge, then the city of Madurai comes. There is a deluge story already we saw with Vishnu. When the deluge was over, then Shiva appears here, and one Pandya by name Raja Shekara Pandya, you see, and the temple was there intact. Everything is disappeared, the hills are there, the temple, and which is the area boundary of my and immediately Lord Shiva asked one of the serpents on him. He is always around with the serpent. Serpent, show him the okay. And uh, and the serpent has the poison, you know, uh all oh all, all of oil. Okay. It makes a inner circle and shows the boundary. The northern boundary is the Rishabagiri according to the Sanskrit religion, which is nothing but Avadagar Oil. Avadagar Malay is its northern boundary. And Tirupuram Mundram is its southern boundary. And the eastern boundary is Tirupuram. And the west boundary is Tiruvedakam. Now you have to say, all the rest of the places where the rains were there, they come and this is the sacred Madurai. So we learn one more point today. What is the sacred Madurai and what is its boundary? It has been said very clearly accepted. And in all the subsequent texts, this has been repeatedly said. The next one. The next one. Now, the great pyramid at Giza. Now the archaeologists are making sense. And they are integrating not only with the eastern and western point of the sunrise and sun moon and mark, but also with the stars in the pyramid. From inside, through the two holes they saw, one of this, one of the what they call holes is directed towards the Sirius. Sirius is a star. If you look at the star sky, we have millions of stars. The previous star is called the Sirius star. You can tell me about the previous star or not? That is called the Sirius. <laughs> we call it also dark star. It is a part of it. What you call a Chinese uh, maker. Okay, it is a, that is now when sun approaches a series, there is a, what you call a uh, 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 flood in the night. Therefore, the series 
automatically becomes a warning signal for the people on the back of them. So nature is healthy. So far we were say, telling that birds and animals are helping man. Not only that, even stars are taking interest in your welfare. Therefore it says, oh man, be cautious. When the sun comes near me, it is called the heliatical rays. Heliatical rays is nothing but every day when the sun rises, you know, you know the, the morning star. Venus is the morning star. So if the Venus is coming slightly before the rise of the sun, Helios, okay, it is called the heliatical rays. That rises first. Instead of Venus, if it is the Sirius which comes first before the sunrise, it is called the heliatical rise. That means it comes just before, a few seconds or hours before the rise of the sun. Then immediately they take the cue, they will be observing, ah, Sirius is rising now just before sun, therefore vacate, vacate. Otherwise, okay, nature is giving signal to you, but you are blind to them today. Therefore, in Matthias, what happened? And what is the consequence? Understand? So, today we have gone far away from nature. Very far away from nature. And we are surrounded by nature everywhere, but we fail to see it. We have eyes, yet we are blind. That is the pity. Now, this is one thing. There is another cavity through which they see the what you call the Orient. That star. The Orion is a star you might have seen in the heaven, which is a very brilliant star. It is always associated with the Shiva. And one of the stars there is called Betelgeuse, which is called the Adirai. Adirayan, Tilvadirai Nachatra. So that shows something like that Adirai. It shows the Tilvadirai Nachatra. So that also becomes very sacred for the Greek. I mean, the Egyptians around 3000 BC. Today in India, we have Thiruvadra is associated with Shiva. Well, these two are giving them some cautions. Thus, they are cavity here also. It, it, it shows the polaris. And thus, you know, everything is oriented. Whatever the plan of this city or in the elevation also, which is the direction, orientation of the directions, all of them have been decided by the rise of the sun and more, the Orient and other stars. In Tamil Nadu, where we have been associating also with one particular star, which is called Canopus, C A N O P U S Canopus, which is associated with Agastya. Seafarers of Tamil Nadu, they go deep into the sea. Any number of day, nights they can spend. They are they are navigating with the help of that one star called the Canopus, which is a which is called in Tamil Agathya. Thus, you know, these tales, they are not cock and bull stories. They are scientific facts told in the form of a Quran. Behind every, behind every what is called Quran or a myth, you have the primitive science being impacted in it. We have to separate them and understand them. That is next one. Next one. Well, now, one thing, this, uh, some of you might have been noticed, or some might not have noticed. Almost all the, all the major rivers in India, they are flowing from the west to east. North-south flow is very rare, unless it is done. Yeah. In North India, you have the river Ganga, Ganges coming. At one place it makes a northern turn, you have the low lying area there, and then goes further, makes a southern turn, then it goes. Whenever a river, east flowing or west flowing river, makes a turn towards the north, north is always associated with the divine, I mean the top of the hill like. Understand? At the top of the hill, gods are there. In the ocean, they are our pitrus are there. You know what is meant by the pitru? 
our forefathers, the departed souls of our forefathers, angels, they are associated now with, with the sea. That's why during the Yamavasa and Adi Yamavasa, we go to the sea and we take a dip and thereby integrating with the values of them. Imbibing the values of my great grandfather, whom they said, You are a rascal, your grandfather is a honest man. I go there and I take a dip. At least from that, I would like to have a rebirth. Understand? Therefore, this is very much there among the people of the South Indian, Indian Tamil people. Taking a bath in a, and many people they have come with the problems to me. I told them, go to Rameshwaram, take a tip. If possible, on a Daya Mavasi or Adiya Mavasi is superior. And you will have the problems solved. And I tell them these stories also. With that they go, have an inner satisfaction, build up a hope, resolve this problem. All our problems emerge over from our own mind. The solution is also there only. Don't go about groping for solution outside your own can And But people like us will show you the direction. You do it. They do it, they get the benefit. Understand? This much of problem. And whenever it moves towards the north, they will be a city here. The city is a sacred city. Kashi is one. Now this is Ganga. Okay, flowing, flowing, Ganga flows northward, still northward, then turns again towards east. This whole space, you know, makes this is Varanasi, the Kasi, as a sacred river. Not only that, at the northern part, you have what you call Varuna River. It becomes the northern boundary, it makes the holiest river. Now take this. In Madurai, you have two holy rivers. One is like a Ganga, you are my guy. And another one coming and joining here is our Kirdima. Therefore, to the sacred geographers of the Hinduism, the pundits, for them, what Varanasi Kashi is in North India, the same is in the South. But with an added value. But with here, an added value in South. Why? What is the added value? The Thiruvayadal Purana. That he didn't play there. The Lord Shiva played so many Thiruvayadal Purana here. Merely it is a chosen poem. Because we believe God is in heaven. That is the first, first house. But more preferred house is at top of the Kailash. Still more preferred place is here in South. Everyone will be by me. By him. Some say it is Chidambaram, some say it is Thiruvalu. And we Pandian people, we said one, one word. He might have slept in your place for some time, but he played here never. <laughs> he might have spent one night in your place, but he has been always thrown here because this fellow was defeated by, <laughs> okay, by one lady called Meenakshi, and both of them have been played here. They are still playing. <laughs> this belief is very strong. Okay. Understand? One of the Thirulayadal is I am speaking, you are listening patiently. You say, great Thirulayadal. Otherwise, Abhinavar is what they will do. The house must become empty. It is a case of God. Okay, that is how. Now, this is one thing we have done. Now, when we went to a far archaeological survey and all that, we three of us. And in 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 Tanjau, uh, 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 near Tanjau, Kumbakon, near Kumbakon, we found a place named called Thiru Valam Suri. Thiru is all the way to Valam Suri. There are river, Kaveri, which was going from west towards east, makes a Valam Suri. That means she is coming from this side, southern side. Then what that place must be sacred for? Sacred for the men as Pitrus. I told this place must have been very sacred also for a time for the Pitrus. Yes, it was. Later Rameshwaram came with a big bang and this left the last is a deposit last <laughs> Understand? <coughs> Wherever it makes a turn, and then subsequently our friend. My wife, Dr. Veda Charam, took me to there and showed some inscription where Raja Raja has performed Tarpanam. 
for the sole satisfaction of his own justice. And following him, his, his own uh, son, Rajendra, then Kurotunga. Am I right? They have left the inscriptions telling that we performed it here. Understand? For them, it is not Rameswaram. What is Rameswaram to pan Indian level? For the Chowas, the Thiruvalam Chudi was the place to meet with or interact with their angels. Am I making these are all little facts, but the little drops make an ocean. These little facts, when you are putting together, and this will enhance your vision. When, when you see, go to, next go to many places, you will naturally be tempted to see. Do not you, your children, that's why I ask people to bring their children here. They will urge you, they will go to your father. This is the river is turning this side. Understand? Thus we have quite a lot to be brought to light yet, but we are seeing, showing some outline directions. That's our next one. And they say Ganga is going far in there. Next one. Yeah. Now, it has become, yeah, recently it became a rage among the scholars to study the sacredity of these places. Sacredity of these places. Thank you. 100 journeys for the spirit. Now, you can make a journey anywhere, bodily, but the sacred geography law makes you take a journey of the spirit. So, you, that journey becomes two types of journey. Outer journey for making money, seeing the places, enjoyment of that, okay, satisfaction and all that, for political reason or social reason, something like that. All these journeys will make for trade and all that. That is called outer journey. But simultaneously, every journey you have to make two, two phases. One is the outer journey, another one is the inner journey. Whenever I go to Trichandu, of course, the seashore, the beautiful position, but I make it a point to go to uh, the place where Saviour was there, Saint Saviour was there, the Upe Dukkara, Palayakaya, Palayakaya. Okay, that's a sacred place for them. And many, many places associated with him, they have put up the wish, I mean, the Portuguese and the Dutch, they have made beautiful churches. They are so peaceful. When you go inside, you need not be a Christian. A Hindu, the amount of spiritual peace he will find out inside the Benaki temple, much more than that, because at least he is nice. The noise is augmented by microphones. There is no such thing. Very peaceful, you can see that. And that, you know, that's very important. Thus, you can make hundred journeys for the spirit. This book is a, it is giving an account of all the important places all over the world. And this book is a best seller. Okay. And the next one, you see, another book, well, an example of the religious pluralism. Madurai is a sacred part. Sainism, Vaishnavism, Sartism, and Kaumara. Kaumara means Kumara Kalao. Understand? For us, no Tirupuramurgan is associated with Kaumara capital. It is one of the Kaumara capitals. The word Kaumara, a few of you might not have heard. Saiva, you might have heard. Vaishnava, this is a capital for Kau. Sainism, Vaishnavism, because of a Parvapatra Stalam. Divya, Divya Desham, they call it. Divya Desham. Okay, and one is our Adagar Malay, and another is a Kuda Adagar, where Periyadwar came and sang, and God immediately approves, and it was here he, he speaks about Vishnu, Pallandu, Pallandu, Pallayarat, and Vardha. So you have, we have heard God blessing man. Here the Bhakta devotee is blessing the God. And this is change of position now because he is charged, surcharged with the spirit of the divine. And therefore, this is a great centre for Vaishnavism and for Kuma Kavara. The Satism, our, our Minakshi is the centre of Satism. In North India, there is a tradition. There are 52 places associated with the Shakti The story goes like that. It's a myth. And there was a fellow called um, on the Talaya Pura Sadachan, Virabhadra, Virabhadra, Dachan, Dachan. Dacha, Dacha had number of daughters, of which one daughter she fell in love with Shiva and married her. At that time he was a Rudra. And he was associated with the cremation ground, therefore the father did not 
agree for their marriage. And this haughty fellow, he is a personification of ego, the Dakshana. Daksha is a Brahmin, he performed a huge yaga for which he invites all the gods, but he ignores Shiva and the, the Dakshayani. Daksha's daughter is called Dakshayani. He goes and pleads her father. What makes you? He is the greatest god among the, all the gods. My, my husband. I say, he is good for nothing fellow. He writes him off. Simply like that. She infuriates the she burns her body and commits a suicide. And her other name is Sati. That's why a wife dying up, I mean, when the husband is dead or insulted, she is called a Sati. And that's the first Sati. And the moment Shiva comes to know about that, his rage knew no bounds. He became mad with rage, comes there, lifts that uh, uh, corpse of that lady and dances madly, tears it to pieces out of rage and throws them and every part falls into 52 places. And all the 52 places in, in India are said to be associated with Shakti. It starts from uh, what do you call it? In uh, Assam. Uh, 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 somewhere. All over India you have. And in that northern district, I mean, Madurai is not included. In South India, we have a list of 52 in which Madurai is considered to be the most important because of Meenakshi. Understand? Thus, you know, nowadays, this sacred geography, uh, a sacred geography can be a big, I mean, a general term, Saiva sacred geography, Vaishnava sacred geography, Shakta sacred geography has 52 places in India, about which one lady, my friend, Diana Yek has brought out a book called, okay, she has written about Benares and that book is a very wonderful book about the sacred geography of the Shakti uh, 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 And, uh, and uh, why for that matter, Tamils have created one of the sacred geographies, a very, very early through our Thirumur Artupadai. Artupadai, six places. One is Thirukuramantra, another is Tirchandur, yet another Swami Malai, yet another, thus six places have been connected, otherwise they have no other connection. The only connection is only through Murugan, that is sacred geography of Murugan. Am I making the point clear for you? Okay. Thus we have number of sacred geographies. In Madurai has number of sacred geographies superimposed upon them. Saifa sacred geography, something like a cake with many layers. Okay, and thus Saiva sacred geography, Vishnama sacred geography, Sarta sacred geography, Kaubara sacred geography, and China and Buddhism. Buddhists had their sacred geography? Yes. In, in, in Chalapadigaram, there is a reference to the temple of the Buddha in Madurai. We, are, we have lost it. Now recently when they dug out, they found out that uh, image of Buddha. Now it is con converted into Pandimuni. Originally it is called Sakya Muni. In Madurai he becomes Pandimuni. Sarvabari is Muni. The statue is that up. And the place from which it has been dug has been the place where the Buddhists had their sacred center. And now, what is Meenakshi temple for the images like you <laughs> and the Pandimuni Koyal is for the four people. The moment they don't hear that, okay, they shriek, push the conductor and they jump out of it. Therefore, conductor is very cautiously <laughs> three miles before he collects the money. <laughs> 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 he knows the effect of the sacred geography. The conductor is always very alert. Okay. Yes or no? Well, next one, sir. Well, Madurai sacred for the religious harmony. Our Lady of our the, the dollars. You have you have that the the what are you talking about? What are you talking about? What are you this is one of the beautiful constructions in the 13th century. So the next one, next one. And you have excellent uh, uh, master scholar, Azharat Kazi Sayyid. Okay, in the Kazi Master in India, you have that mask also. And this uh, hill also, Sikandar Mare, for them, it is not Tirupara Mandra. Tirupara Mandra is for you and I. For them, it is 
Many sacred texts. That's you know, Madurai has a layers of sacred Now, therefore, sacred geography, geography is one, the sacredity is many. Am I making here number of layers of sacred? Next one. Yeah. Now, sacred ground. In, uh, in South Asia, I mean, in South America, among the Red Indians, they hold a mount wherever there is a mountain like structure. <coughs> See, there is one, another, another, another like that. The ground surrounded by the hills is called the sacred ground. They go and make prayer not only for their well being but all for the emancipation of their forefathers, the Pitris. And fortunately for them, they have rivers also, and each river is held very sacred. Therefore, sacred geography. Is as primitive as the man. The earliest part of man's human culture is sacred geography. Next one. Then sacred geography. This is author of this is by uh, this is another book. Next one. Yeah. Now sacred places of I mean places <coughs> of peace <coughs> and power. This is another book. This is a, a national uh, geographic magazine. They have brought out this book, Sacred Asia. This is called the sacred Asia. Another one is going to be sacred India. Next one, sir. Sacred India. India is sacred geography by Diana Ek. Where Sakhism is also being spoken of. Then, I mean, Asia, then India, from India on this, sacred geography of Puri, Jagannath. That book, this is one of the best sellers. Madurai has yet to come out with their book on the sacred geography of Madurai, that's for, I mean, a gentleman has come, the secretary of Intact is here. I, I, I gave him a, what do you call, main message. Please do attend with your wife and children. See how to improve. And Intact, with the help of all of us, should bring out a book on the sacred geography of the Madurai. Okay. We have an excellent organization functioning very well. And we have to, like, we can have all these books as a model. And we have something more to say rather than what they have said. We are tracing the origin from the earliest time of the interaction of man from with the animals and all that that they would not have said. They have not said. Okay, we have to trace the origin. How man identified sacredity from the instinct of the animals and birds. Okay, next one. Now, this is, again, every settlement uh, in, uh, in in Europe, example, why for that matter, I will tell you that uh, uh, Stonehenge. The Stonehenge is a sacred place. It is so associated now. It is so oriented that we are, we are performing the Pongal Vida. The Pongal Vida is the winter solstice time. This is the day of the winter solstice, which is sacred all over the world. Somewhere we are performing in a particular fashion with a Pongal. Therefore, Pongal is Tamil Veda. Not that day. That day is a sacred for all mankind all over the world. In the form of Pongal form is purely the Tamil one. Am I making the difference? This we have to bear in mind. They are offering goat. We don't give goat. Kill goat. The next day we make Matu Pongal. Understand? Therefore, it is nothing to do with the bloodshed. That is, I mean, wherever, I mean, in that uh, 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 stone hedge, recent archaeologists they have found on the day of the Taipungal, or the winter solstice, and the summer solstice comes on Adi Amavasi. We have two Amavasi, you know, one Adi Amavasi, the Amavasi. Near that you have the summer solstice on Adi, and the winter solstice on and the and on both these days, when the sun rises from the east, one from the northern side, another from the southern side, okay, and the shed falls on a particular stone which is considered as a sacred stone, like a Lipuya. This is this belongs to 2500 BC in Stonehenge, and this should have prevailed all over the world, and that tradition starts there. But continues even today. Now, suddenly, sorry, 
சித்திர மாசம் அப்படியே அந்த நல் வந்து லிங்கத்துல வெளிச்சம் ஒருத்தர்ட்டிங் <laughs> Okay, that is in the case of Islam. But here, they have to, all these rays of the sun must convert on this particular point, which is uh, something like a linga, even today it is happening in, in India. I mean, making it, that is a vestige of the sacred car, an emblem or a signal of the, the sign of the sacred car. Today, since we are broken off from the tradition, we consider that as something very wonderful but there is nothing wonders sir fullena wonder la we have lost connection we have the purpose of our lecture is to to sensitize us about our own culture and to create an interest in them and to visit those places and make a note when it we do not make a note of them the simple thing you know the simple thing just now i told you for the sacred geography geography is very sacred for the muslims the swim market actually is not not very big in one of our lectures we quote on the 28th of may today 21st of may 22nd 28th of may sun is exactly on the zenith above that kaaba stone sun casts no shadow at a dull rock in kaaba that day if you have to sanctify yeah 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 mass you can build the mass have a door i mean on the western side you have a wall and there is a kind of in in clay there that in clay has to be done based upon the sun's shadow cast in your place at the tall rock tall rock it has no shadow in mecca at the same tall rock where what is tall rock there in your place because you are on the eastern okay what you call uh uh um uh, 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 uh okay that is what you call the longitude the longitude and you have to make a calculation exactly at it at 1218 it is according to indian standard time you know i mean 2 2:18 2:18 minutes at that time place a pole in your house somewhere and see the cast the sun casting a shadow okay make a mark make a circle make the shadow make a mark and extend the mark and the extended portion is facing towards mecca otherwise those days they didn't have compass they didn't have compass they didn't have a huge atlas but the geography was somehow or other was managed by them without compass and atlas and then now they are making a study of it with all your gadgets and every meter of it is called m i h r a b meter of it the wall there will be a meter of then you are sitting here the meter of will straight away go to mecca that's right if you are making a circle here and a pole the pole will cast a shadow here then you extend it this way and you will find out where the mecca will be put up this is how it is being done for ages from 800 ad onwards till now this is part of sacred geography it is called the sacred geometry this geometry is called sacred geometry now who is called the sacred geometry and when we are building our uh, our shiva temple or vishnu temple according to agamas in the agamas there is one whole chapter which we call as sacred geometry in the sacred geometry isakim is very important kannimoli is very important all these factors we have to bear in mind and it is a, such a vast subject next one but very interesting where this one next one these are all interesting for madurai madurai now you have the vaigai river 
So this is not actually, this is not, on the southern bank you have this Madurai city with the temple in the center and this, here is uh, this Kirdimal river having the origin coming, going and merging in the well, Madurai also, understand? Understand? And which city comes to your memory now? Kashi. In Kashi also, similarly, it is circled by two. Now it is flowing this way, northward. It is going, the river is flowing towards the north. Therefore, this site has been taken as an important place for them. Next one. And now this is the Kerima River. He came in the form of a fish. That the story I told you now. This is the Manchavatara. And for your information, many of us know, may not know about the the event of the so-called Manchavatara has taken place in Madurai at Kriti Madhuri. This is a very one. I mean, it plays with the Sudhya Okay, then the episode is highly symbolic in acknowledging the role of the South in the rescue of the Indian traditions. And here, the four Vedas, like four children, is being taken. Saved by him, the Pandya king is to show, and, the, and here this is Mancha and Vishnu is to show. Next one, Mayam Kokur in Paripada, Madhura is being shown. Mayam Kokur Malaranda Tamare Kukur Purayam Sirur Puriti. The whole town is modeled after a blossom of the lotus. The significance, the symbolism of the lotus in Indian culture requires a separate speech, a separate lecture. It's so important for us. It is not so aromatic like your old jasmine or rose. Yet, spiritually number one. Simple. Again, it is simple. Just now I told you, a river flowing towards the east or west, if it makes a turn towards the north, sacred for the gods, makes a turn towards the south, sacred for the Pitrus. This is what we said. But now, uh, uh, I was telling about no? lotus. 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 The city is arranged in such a way like the arrangements of the petals of the lotus and that is one of the important features of not only Madurai, many cities, almost all the sacred cities all over the world, they have a cosmic center as the okay, the center and around it. If this is this has this, uh, if this is found even in Sumeria. The Zugurat will be the center and the concentric squares. And will be sticks, and the Madurai has been patterned similarly even during the Sangam period, and therefore that is the earliest phase of the urbanization of Madurai. The urbanization is a time when they are sacralizing the geography. The geometry will be sacralized in association with the, the east to west orientation and all that. The next one, the next one, next one, next one. Yeah, this is the all cities now, this is called Sarvato Bhagavad scheme. You have to, you can approach the temple from anywhere. This is a common one given by Varaha Mihira in his book. And Varaha Mihira does in 5th century. The same period, this Madurai was built similarly. Varaha Mihira wrote about it. He did it here. Understand what he wrote now. This is Sarvato Bhagavad but wherever you go, you ultimately they will lead you to that center. And thus it has to be I mean, arranged very practical. They are theoretical. Here we are very practical in the next one. Well, this is a how to the diagram it will take now. Well, the sacred spots of Shiva and Madurai. What makes Madurai so important is the sacred spot of the first spot is about the effacement of the sun. Sin of Indra, Indra like Padidirta Pavan. That we will see in the next uh, lecture. Okay, since it is already 7 o'clock. Okay. Uh, you will be also tired. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
we will have to do. Yeah, we will take up this one. How the second? So far, sacredity in general we have said. The next lecture we will say the sacredity associated with Shiva and more so with our mother Nina. Both of them we are going to see in the next lecture. And in another lecture, how Vishnu makes it still more sacred by his arrival with the fanfare from Alagar Koyil. And the sacred creation identification of sacredity is one thing. More important is the creation of sacredity by means of a, the sacred geometry. And the most important being the perpetuation of the sacredity by annual festivals. If the festivals are stopped, sacredities are dead. What keeps the sacredity of Madurai alive is willingly. The government does not know that the party is playing and maintaining the sacredity of the Madurai. Understand? He does not know about the sacred geography, but he is maintaining the sacred geography. He speak about it. Understand? Therefore, any, any, I mean, during the time of Kumbhavishena, during the time of that Alagar, after Alagar, we see Yadir Sevai, we go. And Yadir Sevai, when you go and wait for the God, a divine's arrival for some time, of course, we had to forego some time. That time you will feel an experience. That experience makes the ground, the space sacred. Sacred geography is not a mere science. It is a science born out of the experience of the man, about which we will speak in the next class. I mean, sorry, the teacher. <laughs> next lecture. <laughs> okay. Next well, lecture. Well, Thank you for your attention. If you have some questions to ask, Please do ask. In the next lecture, I will try my best to answer them.